You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Hey, everybody. Uh, back again with another spine citation classic. Um, I'm Soham, uh, PGY3 at Indiana. Good evening, everyone. This is um, Jose Chacon, medical student at the American University of Integrative Science of Barbados. Hey, guys. And this is Jay, one of the co-founders of Nailed It and uh, one of the residents at University of Cincinnati. All right. So we get into today's topic. We're going to be focusing on uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So we'll run through a brief background just to kind of kick things off. Um, so scoliosis uh, is, is a broad term, generally refers to abnormal curvature um, of the spine. Most people think about uh, coronal plane deformities for scoliosis, um, but in, in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis specifically, it's important to consider the rotation um, as well as uh, you know sagittal plane deformity. So we, we consider it a three-dimensional deformity. And this is one of the hallmark features of, of AIS um, you know, in comparison to you know, the degenerative scoliosis or um, you know, adult type scoliosis. Uh, so some of the other subtypes, uh, congenital, uh, neuromuscular, um, and then, you know, the family of idiopathic scoliosis has uh, three subtypes, infantile, juvenile, um, and adolescent, which we're going to be focusing on today. Um, we mentioned secondary, it can be occurring due to, you know, um, other uh, processes such as tumor, um, post-cardiac surgery, uh, and then degenerative scoliosis, which is in the adult population. Um, so just a couple of definitions. One of my peds attendings taught me this, uh, intern years, the rule of tens. Uh, for scoliosis, so for, for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, so age greater than 10, curve greater than 10 degrees in the coronal plane, um, and it is 10 times more common in females. The typical curves we see uh, are right thoracic um, with a left lumbar curve, and then uh, generally uh, these patients are hypokyphotic uh, in the sagittal plane. Um, you know, there's tons of scoliosis screening protocols through, through elementary schools, school nurses, primary care doctors. I mean, they do the Adams forward bend test. So that's just when you have, uh, you know, the patient lift up their, their shirt or their gown and uh, bend forward and touch their toes. And you can assess the abnormal rotation of their ribs um, due to the, the rotational abnormalities in scoliosis. And so the, the scoliometer is one of the devices we use. And uh, there's some, some correlation between the number of degrees of rotation and the coronal plane deformity that are not super important. So um, one, of the, one of the things we always talk about is back pain. Um, generally speaking, obviously there's caveats to everything, but most curves uh, under 30 degrees um, are thought to be asymptomatic and contributing to uh, musculoskeletal back pain, um, which becomes a, a hot topic of conversation in clinic uh, with these patients and their families. Uh, a couple of things about the workup of AIS. Uh, we talk about x-rays. Uh, generally speaking, we get AP x-rays in orthopedics, but in, in uh, scoliosis, we get PA, uh, full-length spine films, so that uh, the right side of the screen is actually the patient's right. You can see the, the cardiac silhouette is inverted. Um, and then important to consider getting an MRI for atypical curves. So um, any curve outside of the right thoracic left lumbar, um, patients with neurologic abnormalities, foot deformities, asymmetric reflexes. Um, and some people uh, I know get MRIs on all males with AIS. So uh, that's generally the, the uh, imaging workup. And then treatment, and um, we can talk about a little treatment a little bit more as we get into some of these papers uh, that we're gonna discuss. So kick it over to Jose uh, to take things off with the first paper. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, as mentioned, uh, this is the first of our uh, papers here. These next two uh, papers are presented was present was written by the same author by uh, Winstein and all. So this first one is published by Lancet uh, from two thousand eight, and the 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 aim to this this paper here was basically give a comprehensive review of basically of all the existing um existing researches on on AIS based upon pathonomy, di diagnostics, and even management of it. So the way how they did it was basically just like when you do any kind of a systematic review slash meta-analysis kind of thing, it's just basically use a database. In this case, they use Crohn Library and Medline to, and to do our search within the previous 10 years at the time of the study. And listed here, they had drawn lists some um, search items like uh, AIS, late onset scoliosis, uh, okay, natural history, pathogenesis, etc. We'll just downline associated with uh, with this condition here, and then as well as also in addition, book chapters will also include here. So, um, even though um, one of the the reason they did this was that prior to this is that 
the the background information about AIS in terms of its state and as well as also treatment so forth was kind of unknown. You know, many had the idea, but it was not very clear. So, so what Winstein and all did was to make was to basically come up with their own way of as a guide to develop what ways for to how we go about what are the treatment options, etc. And what they did was for this for the first portion here was basically did the uh, the pathogenesis of this condition. Basically, what they found was it was they found a lot of genetic variations to it. Could be also dominant on uh, sex dependent penetrance, um, as well as also they also looked into certain different genes of for um, associated to it, like fibrin one, collagen, elastin, uh, herbin sulfotransferase. And, um, and as well as also, they even sought out other horm, um, genes um, associated to estrogen, vitamin D, and melatonin. And as well as also, they also hypothesis on the basically involving abnormalities in platelets, um, some of them, the paravertebral muscles and anterior spinal growth as well. So as you can see, it was a pretty elaborate list on it as well. And, um, and, and next they did was they went through the basic round um, the background information in terms of their natural course and so forth. And um, the one of the problems with this one is that it, in the issue with this, this portion here was basically they had issues with uh, about inclusions of patients from due to other known causes that uh, that uh, Sarham mentioned earlier about there were many causes of it, but it was too, they were not very set on that, including those for early onset, uh, late onset, even uh, failure to assess as well. As well as also the location of the curvature, um, as well as also the progression, pains, as well as other uh, concerns, particularly the cardiopulmonary problems and even the psychosocial aspects of it. And what they noted was throughout this, this search, they realized that the, the more skeletally immature the patient is, the greater probability of the curvature process, progression, which makes a lot of sense when you consider it, consider the fact that the, if the, the um, if the skeleton or the bone formation is not is not fully formed, it's susceptible to any kind of uh, uh, pathological um, changes over time there. And then afterwards, they realize that they they stay here that the large larger the curve of presentation, the higher likelihood of progression both before and after maturity there. And naturally, um, and oftentimes this is where it goes down. And then this goes down to the aspects of the treatment option here, knowing that um, it's particularly what age range and so forth there. And even though this was, even though AIS for the non-surgical treatment aspect, they've realized that AIS is very commonly known, is well known, but the treat the challenge was what was the best treatment? And that depends on where you are in the world. Like here in the US could be one way, um, in other countries like in Europe is another, Asia, et cetera. Um, one thing also to many of these patients are in still in the state of growth. Usually these children are continuing and growing. And oftentimes, oftentimes our most common way to, um, to see is just observe. Usually when you take the measurement, you do this um, as well as also the, when you do the x-ray imaging, you also, as you recall from the previous um, discussion we had on, on the adult onset of scoliosis, we mentioned about common triangle. And, and the rule of thumb is that anything less than, usually 30 degrees, usually indication will be, we just be plain observation and just follow up will be sufficient. And of course, if it goes beyond that, then we have to go to further management. In this case here, using the binder, as you can indicate for the picture here. And one of the problems was, is that, um, one of the problems with these binders is that oftentimes these, these binders were very difficult oftentimes, very cumbersome oftentimes, but despite that does have shown, it does have has some, um, Help with it. Although when this the time of this paper was made, it didn't really didn't really show. Uh, it did didn't see anything that was indication that would help there. But when we discussed the the next paper, it would tell a different story there. And um, what they found out in Europe is that the the usually the first line treatment for um for these children is usually um physical therapy, which is, which is quite interesting there. And even though they, there's still some little ish controversies on whether that's still effective or not there. And of course, and, and of course, um, with over time, if, if these non-surgical or conservative management has not helped, then we had to go further to surgical managements, particularly those with pro more progressive um, outcomes. 
And one of the things, and they list in here the re, some of the reasons for for the instrument uh, circle treatment with instrumentation includes arrest progression, achieve maximum penetrant collection deformity, improve appearance, and keep a short term long term complication to a minimum. And as mentioned earlier, that they they there shows that around greater than Cobb angle of forty five degrees was was usually indicating for for surgery for surgical management there. Their approach was basically a posterior instrumentation fusion with or without corrective ostomy was the mainstay treatment for it. And determine the levels included in a could involve multifacial uh, analysis there. However, but like anything else, depending on the, the progression of the condition there, sometimes surgery can be delayed uh, temporarily or even until adulthood. So it's one of those things, it's one of those things that depends how the the body reacts sometimes it could be very quickly other times slow but that really depends it's a really case by case basis on that so in conclusion there although despite a lot of the uh, still remain a uh, controversial issue with ais there this paper has done um, i would say a good job as to give it a more of a solid um a, a solid um, guide as a as a give foundations for it, even though bear in mind that this study was came up like about close to 15 years ago, but it, it's it was a something it was something that gave gave a start, kind of like a map of what we can leave from there, and then over time we could do further studies to improve it, with, with um, especially increase of different improvement in surgical management technology, as well as also with more better um, treatments that can even to even to improve our awareness and even how we can. Um, but further manage these these conditions. Yeah, I think that I mean the main take home point for me from this paper was, uh, and the reason I think it was included and in, in so highly cited was um, basically uh, they came to the conclusion that, that there is no known common underlying cause. So uh, they put the the idiopathic in the AIS. So um, you know obviously they ran through treatment algorithms and, and this was published in two thousand eight before um, you know the, the bracing paper we're about to discuss. So uh, there was inconclusive evidence at the time um, on the effects of bracing. Uh, so, so they did a good job, but I think the, the main take on point for me was that, like you mentioned, the idiopathogenesis is, uh, they looked at so many different things, but they, they didn't find anything. Uh. Okay, and next, uh, this next paper, as mentioned by, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is also by, by one Steen et al. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was basically looking to more into the bracing aspect of it. And um, as I mentioned earlier, this is mentioned earlier that they, um, their approach was to this is basically do a core heart multi-center approach to, in terms of the, um, many ad, like criteria like age, skeletal maturity, and degree of scoliosis. To give a little background about this, um, that as you know, that a lot of times scoliosis is usually more, we were associated with more with children, particularly young and 16, but some cases can progress into a, uh, can further progress in childhood into adolescence, or even sometimes it can be delayed and wait until adulthood to for further progression there. And as I mentioned earlier, that it really depends, it's a case by case basis there. In the past, when they were trying to do with um, bracing, a lot of times they were trying to do the um, the very rigid approach. It was one of the most common ones they did for, for progression, for progression of the curvature. And of course, uh, over time, there has been different designs and as well as also um, uh, purpose, and as well as also even uh, types of designs that oftentimes um, to relieve pressure and even to be in addition to to re um to, to prevent the progression of the of the curvature to to worsen there, so what did was that so previous studies suggested that bracing decreased the risk of curvature progression, but the results were inconsistent, and this is one of the issues they they encounter in the, some of the prior studies there. So in effort doing this, they decided to, to conduct it, the um do bracing there in order to um preventing curvature progression, even to that 50 degree, uh, 45, 50 degree uh, uh, threshold for the, for to prevent reaching for uh, surgical management. So what they did was, what in Winstein and all did was, they um, they did what's called the BRACED trial, which stands for Bracing in Adolescence Idiopathic Scoriosis Trial in 25 institutions across the US and Canada. 
Uh, originally, they did was to make a uh, clinical uh, randomized clinical trial, but however, for, uh, however, um, they did allow the adult the families to choose made a cho choose to have preference in which kind of um, trial they they want their child to be in there. So I thought that's rather that's rather interesting there. And then um, they subdivide the population, including those with skeletally immature, with a as well as also uh, with those with clot angles various uh, cob angles there, and as well as also the, the ra radiographic, clinical, orthotic, and even uh, quality of life outcomes, uh, these quality of life outcomes in a six month interval. And the primary outcome was to determine the curve pr the per progressions, and as well as also the skeletal immaturity at different, uh, those were above 50 degrees and those were below 50 degrees as well. So, and um, when they conduct and basically, uh, when they when they they run down the their trial here, a hundred about one thousand one hundred eighty three patients were screened, of them which one thousand eighty six met the inclusion, and um, two hundred fifty two met the criteria for primary analysis. These groups were grouped into two groups: the randomized and the IT analysis preference groups. A total of sixty percent, a hundred forty six, sixty percent of patients were braced, and ninety six or forty percent were underwent observation only. So what the, and they did was they walked looked them over time there to see um to see what was the made a, what sort of changes have made over time there in their studies. And the result shows that that unfortunately the um the trial has had to be terminated early due to the fact that uh that the the, the analysis shows that um the spine the, the bracing was so effective that they had to uh, discontinue the bracing early, which it's quite interesting to consider the fact that uh, it was they done in a very quick time there. And as you can see here, that uh, the rate of treatment success was about 72% in the, in the bracing group and 48 in the observation group. And when the adjustment of prosperity score, quantiles, and duration for follow-up, the odd ratios for successful outcomes associated with, with bracing versus observation was 1.93, which indication a very which a high rate there. And then when you go for the IT group, they found that the treatment was successful the 75% among those in the bracing compared to 42% were just based on observation there. And then the when they took the quality of life um, analysis scores, included the um, intended tree analysis, they found there was no significant difference between bracing and observation group at baseline or any adverse effects in any analysis. So this basic the even though this despite the fact that this study did and then um and then overall a lot when they determined temperatures range here for how many hours in terms this was determined the how long they should be embracing for a bit and they've determined that the around at least for about 12, 13 hours, some could be as much as close to about 17 hours in there. Even though they 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 determined that the, was that the, the longer they're on the bracing, therefore at least a minimum of twelve hours, showing greater improvements over time there. And one thing I would would say note that um, even though even though that these uh, bracings were were very successful, but bear in mind that the only issue is for some is that you're concerned about is compliance because sometimes beyond this bracing for even for a couple of hours could be very cumbersome and even uncomfortable and. And especially if you have a you have a um, child in this case who are very like saying very very athletic and very very motivated, it's going to be very sometimes it can be very difficult at times, and and it's not going to be very nice having them on the brace there. But but sure enough, nonetheless, there this shows the significance the importance of the bracing, and as well as also that the longer they're on the brace there, it shows a great improvement there. But as as mentioned earlier there that do bear in mind the ability to consult with the patients and their families, as well as also knowing that, that com non-compliance can be, can be an issue over time. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with the last point you made. Um, the, the compliance is a, is a huge problem. I mean, just from anecdotal experience in the clinic um, with AIS patients and, uh, you know, no, nobody wants to wear a brace to school and, um, you know, some of the, some of our attendings, you know, cite this minimum of 12.9 hours a day and say you, you can wear it, um, you know, when you're sleeping. So that's, you know, usually 10 to 12 hours. And then um, for, for 
the school day and then take it off for sports. And that, that gets you up into the higher ranges. And as you mentioned, the more breaks where you have the, the increased rates of success, but um, you know, nobody wants to, to wear something um, that makes them different at school, especially, you know, in their preteen or teenage years where uh, those things really do matter. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of touch back. I think this is a, a, at least to me, I think this is one of the landmark papers of, of my lifetime and, and we, something we talk about in residency a ton. So um, it's interesting. The study design is, is an interesting to me is, you know, they, they tried to do a randomized controlled trial and uh, the randomization, you know, a lot of patients essentially refused what they were randomized to. So they had to add this second preference group. Um, so that's kind of why they had two study groups in the same study. Um, and, and, you know, like you, you mentioned their primary outcome of interest, they wanted to see, when the curves progress to 50 degrees or when the patients achieve skeletal maturity without a curve of 50 degrees. So I just wanted to clarify that, that that was their primary outcome of interest. Um, so uh, like, like you mentioned, you know, they had to stop the trial early, which is crazy. They showed that bracing was so effective at, at preventing curve progression that, um, you know, this 25 centered uh, randomized controlled trial, you know, uh, with, uh, federal funding was essentially stopped because it, they, they found that this, um, you know, rigid TLSO brace could prevent curve progression to a threshold requiring a, a, a pretty extensive surgery. So, um, you know, this is something that has been uh, widely cited and spread all throughout, you know, pediatric primary care and, and uh, it's become a very large emphasis in, in uh, scoliosis management. So definitely an important paper to know. Um, I think you did a really good job talking about the, the results there. Um, so let's move along uh, to the next one. So this one kind of is a jump back in time. You know, we've, we've referenced a couple of papers um, so far that, that incorporate the, the lanky classification system. So this is, um, you know, the original paper published in 2001 uh, in JBJS uh, out of Wash U in St. Louis um, by, by Dr. Lanky et al. So th this was their uh, proposal of a, what they call a new classification system. Um, for, for AIS uh, with a goal to determine the extent of spinal fusion. And, and one of the things, um, you know, orthopedics were notorious for uh, classification systems. I mean, we have classification systems to, to classify our classification systems, but um, some of our, my attendings have said uh, this and it, it stuck to me is that, you know, the ones to remember are uh, the ones that can guide treatment um, or prognosis. So, uh, you know, just a descriptive classification system is, is uh, is useless um, uh, for all effective purposes. So I think that's the importance of this paper. They wanted to, to help determine the extent of spinal fusion in, in young patients where motion is, um, you know, something they want to preserve. So like we said, you know, there was, there were previous classification systems. The, the King classification system uh, was a one-dimensional uh, classification based on the coronal deformity, had five subtypes, um, but very poor inter and intra observer reliability. Um, so uh, th these authors suggested a, a new classification system that incorporated a two-dimensional analysis, um, and uh, they wanted to validate it uh, and, and allow it to uh, help them determine which levels to fuse. So they had a, um, multiple radiographic views, essentially, um, AP and lateral uh, full-length spine films, as well as benders. Uh, for, for 27 patients that were reviewed by two groups of, of surgeons from the Scoliosis Research Society. Um, and they, they determined this classification system uh, that we can go through here in detail a little bit further um, and then calculate the inter and intra observer reliability to validate it. So this is the classification system they, they came up with. And, and at a first glance, this, this sheet is a lot, um, but it's important just to kind of go step by step. And I'm not going to sit here and belabor all the points, but essentially what they did was um, they described the curve type um, and then determine, you know, whether the curves are structural or non-structural based on bending films. So, uh, you know, the major curve is always considered structural, major being uh, the largest Cobb angle. Um, and then if, you know, there's a second curve, typically, you know, in the lumbar spine, um, and that, that can bend out uh, on the bending films and um, to less than 25 degrees, that becomes a minor uh, non-structural curve. Um, and then they had modifiers, so a lumbar spine, spine modifier is basically uh, you know, you have your curve type one through six, and then you, you uh, modify it either A, B, or C, depending on this line called the CSVL um, that you can draw on your AP radiograph. Uh, and whether the CSVL touches 
uh, sorry, goes between the, the pedicles of the stable vertebra, uh, touches the vertebral body of the apex, or is medial to the apex, um, gives you the modifiers in A, B, or C. Um, and then you use your lateral x-ray to determine the, the thoracic kyphosis from T5 to T12. So that, that gives you your um, classification you know, from a curve type, a, a modifier, um, and then sagittal profile. Uh, and so, you know, this is obviously a lot. And one of the criticisms that the authors point out themselves is that th there can be 42 combinations of curves. So, you know, it's not something you're going to sit there in clinic for all your scoliosis patients and calculate, but it is something to use uh, for preoperative planning. Um, so, you know, this is discussing a little bit further on how to uh, determine your modifiers A and B. So, they wanted to, to validate this. That was the goal of this paper. And, and what they showed was, you know, the inter observer reliability. So, um, you know, between observers and intra, meaning within the same observer multiple times, uh, there was excellent ranges, uh, you know, in the, in the um, low 90s for um, a validated uh, Kappa value indicating what was good to excellent reliability. So, um, you know, all five reviewers agreed on curve types in 22 patients out of their uh, 27, and four out of the five had agreed in the remaining five. So, uh, you know, they they essentially were able to validate this classification system. And, um, you know, one of the things that I recommend for anybody in residence here or medical students who are going to be in these scoliosis cases um, is, is to read through this. Um, and based on the curve subtype, so if you have the x-rays in front of you, you can sit there and think about uh, the extent of the fusion. So obviously, primarily, um, the main curves are in the thoracic spine and, and the lumbar spine is where we have a majority of our, um, you know, motion from in terms of flexion and rotation. So that's why, you know, we, we talk about doing selective thoracic fusions or, or preserving uh, lumbar levels. And, and that's what uh, this classification system is really aiming to do is to determine when you can avoid fusing the lumbar spine or, or minimizing fusion of the lumbar spine. And um, these authors discuss that in detail. So definitely a, an important classification system to know for uh, scoliosis surgery. So in conclusion from this paper uh, in 2001 was that they, they validated this uh, novel classification system, uh, novel at the time, um, to determine, uh, you know, one, a reliable way to classify these uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis curves and, and also to uh, guide uh, treatment and diffusion levels um, when, uh, when talking about surgical management. So uh, talking about surgical management, um, this is another, uh, I think, more historical paper um, for us, at least in the generation of seeing uh, only pedicle screws. It's interesting to me that uh, they had this comparative analysis uh, of pedicle screws versus hook instrumentation um, for, for posterior spinal fusion of, of AIS. So this was uh, by Dr. Kim et al. published in Spine in 2004, um, also out of um, you know, Wash U in St. Louis. So this was a retrospective matched cohort um, to compare uh, posterior instrumented fusion with either you know pedicle screw fixation versus hook constructs. So um, just a brief background, you know there was uh, you know there has been a multitude of evolutions and iterations of surgical treatment in scoliosis, including you know Harrington rods and, and these hook constructs and um, you know pedicle screws are something that we're very familiar with in our residency and training is is that. That's the only fixation I have seen in, in the spine. Um, you know, maybe some hooks in, in some scoliosis cases at the, the top of the construct, but um, primarily everything I've seen is pedicle screws. So um, at the time of this paper, uh, pedicle screw fixation was, was uh, relatively new and had, had been shown to have biomechanical advantages and um, improved correction levels in some studies um, and, and advantages in the lumbar spine compared to conventional hook instrumentation. But not studied specifically in AIS. So, so these authors wanted to directly compare uh, pedicle screw versus hook instrumentation uh, with multiple outcomes of interest. So the, the degree of curve correction, uh, junctional changes, length of fusion, operative time, blood loss, cost, um, pulmonary function, and then uh, subjective uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, so the way they did this was interesting. They had uh, 52 patients, 22 sc uh, pedicle screws and 22 hooks. It was prospective data collection in the pedicle screw group and retrospective in the hook group. Um, and, and all patients had a minimum two-year post-op follow-up. So the, the choice to, to proceed with an all pedicle screw construct was determined by the senior author based on the lengthy classification, pedicle size, and, and uh, just by surgeon preference. And then they went back and matched the patients that had gotten pedicle screw constructs with prior patients who had gotten uh, 
all hook constructs uh, from the same surgeon in the past. Um, and then they match these patients according to the lanky classification, fusion levels, uh, age at surgery um, to allow, you know, minimal confounders. So there's a little chart on, on here for those of you, of you looking at the PowerPoint. Um, there was no significant difference in the lanky classification, um, age, uh, skeletal maturity. So uh, thought that was interesting. They were able to match the study groups. Um, so interesting, uh, you know, the results after their, their fusion, um, there was a significant decrease in the, the post-operative, immediate post-operative cob angle in the pedicle screw group um, compared to the hook group. And uh, immediate post-operative cob was 16 in the pedicle screw group and 33 in the hook group. So, I mean, 33 is still uh, a pretty substantial high, uh, substantially high curve. And then the at two-year follow-up, the major curve uh, correction averaged 70 degrees in the screw group and 42 in the hook group, also statistically significant. Um, and as well as uh, uh, improvement in kyphosis. Uh, and interestingly, in the hook group, which um, it, they discuss is, you know, it's not clinically significant, it's uh, just statistically significant. Um, one of the things they did also find was a, a slight improvement in pulmonary function tests in the uh, pedicle screw group at uh, two years post-operative follow-up, um, which, uh, you know, again, may or may not be clinically relevant. Um, and they do mention that the, the pedicle screw constructs at that time did have a, a slightly higher cost. So, so this is interesting because it was, you know, at, at, at a time where fixation methods were changing um, and, uh, you know, we were transitioning to basically these all pedicle screw constructs, which we see as the mainstay of treatment now. So, so these authors concluded, you know, at that time that this pedicle screw instrumentation, although what uh, was, was more expensive, had a significant, uh, significantly better major or minor curve correction um, and maintenance of that correction at two years. Uh, without neurological problems and a slightly improved pulmonary function. Um, and they did actually have a shorter uh, arthrodesis length than the, the segmental uh, hook instrumentation. So, you know, that was a concern with, with the pedicle screws was, um, was neurologic compromise, um, you know, either by breaching the pedicles and, and impinging on neurologic structures. And, and so they were able to show there was no significant difference in their neurologic complications. And they were able to uh, preserve more segments in the fusion and get a better correction with pedicle screws.